It is indeed an honor uh, to be able to interview in this forum. Uh, the Institute of Cultural Diplomacy is uh, welcoming, welcoming you, Mr. Co Cochon. So my first question would be, the Institute of Cultural Diplomacy is currently conducting a research analysis on state multiculturalism. As a member of one of the diverse cultural groups that characterize the harmonic multicultural example of the Canadian society, what do you believe are the main aspects of the multicultural practices of your countries that should be taken as example by European policymakers? <coughs> Canada, as, as we all know, is a, is a big country with a, uh, a population that's not, uh, that's not that big. Actually, today I believe we're, our Canadian population is around 33 million people, roughly. So we, we've, uh, we've always been a, a land of, uh, uh, open to immigration. And uh, I'm not going to start in, in, in mentioning what, what former Prime Minister Christian was saying when he was coming to, uh, to Europe and speaking to, uh, to uh, various countries here. Uh, they were always asking the same question about immigration. And former Prime Minister Chrétien used to say, you know what, stop seeing immigration as a problem and start seeing immigration to a great asset for your communities, a great asset uh, for your country, and added value as well. I mean, we should, in Canada, we celebrate differences. So we accept people coming from all over the world respecting their background as well, embracing their experiences, because that experience is, is a diverse experience that makes Canada stronger. And if you make Canada stronger and working together, we are building, in other words, a much better, a much better country. So, and of course, we have a set, uh, a set of values that exist in our constitution. The Canadian Charter of Rights is there. And all the people as well work around the principle of the Canadian Charter of Rights. And it's a question of attitude as well. It's a question of mind mindset uh, we Canadians like to uh, to have debate to have strong debate we like to build consensus as well and once it's over we rally we support the decision uh, you know there's many examples in the past that I can I can speak about but this is one of the strength of our Canadian society we can have we really can have strong tough debate uh, and then afterwards once the decision is taken it's over all the people rally People are supportive, and we move forward together. This is Canada. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, you described one of the strengths of Canada. Uh, however, the population of Quebec just uh, elected a prime minister coming from a separatist um, party. And how do you see this affecting the process uh, towards an harmonic uh, regional devolution? Uh, th th that that's uh, interesting. I mean, uh, as you know, we've been uh, we've been involved dealing with the sovereignist party in Canada since uh, the first time it was 1976. Um, and you know, the Canadian Federation is uh, is uh, in terms of devolution, giving power. Each provinces they have their own jurisdictions according to the constitution. The Canadian government as well, they have uh, has his own uh, his own uh, jurisdictions. And it's not a very centralized federation when you look at it and you compare the Canadian Federation to other federations in the world. But having said that, the fact that we now have a, a new government in Quebec, it's a sovereignist government. For the time being, I, I, I think uh, they will focus on, uh, on the economy, balancing the book. If you look at their last budget, this is exactly what, they, uh, what they're trying to do. Um, and bear in mind the fact that for now, it is a minority government. So I don't believe that for the next uh, few months we're going to be facing a threat on that side in terms of the, uh, the Canadian national unity. Uh, but if they would get re-elected as a majority government, of course discussion would, uh, would start again. But Canadians have been able to manage that through a consensus, through discussion, and as well using democratic tools. I mean, we've been using referendum many times in the past. And today, we must say that the, the landscape in Canada has changed a lot uh, if we compare with the, uh, the 80s or the, uh, the 90s. Uh, the provinces uh, today, when you look at the uh, Ontario, you look at Alberta, you look at uh, British Columbia as well, the Atlantic provinces, all the provinces are more mature, uh, are growing in importance. And of course, they have built, uh, they have created, I mean, some times ago, what they call the Consul of the Federation, whereby the provinces are getting around the same table together, can share their concern, share their problems, and create what I call a new power vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the Canadian government. And I guess that the fact that the provinces are and territories are working together, it is very healthy for the Canadian, uh, for the Canadian uh, uh, Federation. 
So the last question would be, um, what do you believe is the potential of corporate cultural diplomacy practices within the increasingly globalized international markets? And to what extent do you believe that they can contribute to a fairer system regarding the respect of human rights within the business world? I mean, t today, I mean, we live in a global marketplace. Um, of course, we have free trade agreement everywhere in the world. Uh, people are working within the, uh, the principle of WTO. So in other words, the barriers to, uh, to trade, uh, we're trying to get rid of those, uh, those uh, barriers, barriers. But having said that, living in a global marketplace, one thing will, re will remain, and it's the question of the uh, cultural differences. So we need to uh, speak to each other. We, lead, we need to uh, learn from each other. We need to, uh, to uh, talk, go, it goes through dialogue as well. And moving forward, when I look at the, uh, what's going on in the world, I believe that there is more room today than ever for what I call soft power and cultural diplomacy. And you look, I mean, we were talking earlier about the question of the, the private sector being involved in, uh, in such a, a diplomacy. They do that indeed when they, uh, I mean, when, you are a, uh, when you're leading a multinational, for example, and you have, uh, you have officers all over the world. Most of the time, when you will celebrate something in another country, you're gonna do it uh, using art, you're using, using culture. So I guess it's good, and it's in getting uh, to know each other better that we're gonna be able to find solution through, uh, through consensus. In other words, we really need, actually, to stand for principles, to stand for, for values, and embrace differences. And it's, uh, it's in talking to each other that we're gonna find solution. So thank you very much uh, for your very interesting answers and it was an honor to priv to interview you. Yes. Thanks thank you for very inviting. Much. It's my privilege to be here. <laughs> thank you very much.